Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here in Oslo, Norway, where we're going to be speaking about Casey Kasem and popular music. And I have with me two guests, Christian Suma, who is a neighbor of the cemetery that we are in currently, uh, and Hans Wiesenthout, who is a professor at the University of Oslo. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Christian, maybe if we could start with you. Why are we in this cemetery? Why, how did you become connected to Casey Kasem? And can you frame this story a little bit? Because it's a crazy story. Well, I, um, I'm reading papers, and uh, for some years ago, I discovered that Casey Kasem were buried here in Oslo, which is kind of strange. After all, I got to know Casey Kasem when I was in my 20s, during the 80s. We didn't have too much uh, radio channels in Norway at the moment, so we listened to Swedish radio for music, and we listened to Norwegian radio, and we had the American Forces radio here in Norway, as uh, Americans were stationed here. So, and through this I got to know the American um, Top 40 with Casey Kasem, and I listened to him for many years, and uh, well, uh, at some point uh, time went by, I guess he, he uh, disappeared out of my mind and then reappeared uh, as a bird here in my neighborhood. Well, that's really interesting. And, and just for the record, you're one of the people who takes care of his unmarked grave here in Oslo. I am taking very respectfully care of his uh, grave. I, I, I passed the graveyard on my way to my office and uh, and back from my office, and sometimes I go just to see to his grave. Well, that's great. And Hans, you are at the University of Oslo, but you're an expert in popular music. And I thought that it would be interesting for you to comment a little bit, and if we could chat a little bit about the importance of popular music in societies and what Casey Kasem may have meant in the United States, he may have meant in other places as well. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, at uh, our university, we have a large department and a lot of students also studying popular music. So, you know, I think um, popular music, you know, is significant to, to people's lives. So, so you could think about Top 40, you know, just as, you know, what is selling it, you know, it's a business. Uh, on the other hand, you know, people kept their records in their homes and people listened to music. So, so in a way, it's like the soundscape to, you know, growing up or, as Christian said, you know, to, to, to people's lives. You know, music is important. But is music important from place to place in a different way? So is music, is the, are the top 40 songs in Norway different from the top 40 songs somewhere else? Uh, yeah, but, but I would say that, you know, in, here in Norway, we uh, listen to American music, you know, uh, especially of, of, of from the 60s on. I mean, also from the 50s, you know, with, with Elvis Presley and, and, you know, rock and roll and then, you know, uh, rock and pop music. So American music, but also British music is, is what was maybe most influential on, on youth culture in Norway, I would say. A little bit Swedish also, yeah, maybe. And what about the issue of, does the top 40 say anything about who we are as a people? So let's say we were having this discussion in England. Would their top 40 be different from the top 40 in the United States or Norway or Japan? Uh, definitely. Uh, and, you know, uh, I mean, the thing that's almost absurd about thinking of a case of being here, you know, is that all the Norwegians who wanted to make it on to the American top 40, uh, and, you know, that's... Uh, that, that's a different story, you know, so, so um, I mean, it's been very hard. So, so a lot of the story about popular music in Norway in the 70s was about how can we make it internationally. Uh, and, you know, the first really major Norwegian act that did this was AHA in, in 1985. Uh, and, and then it's a little bit changed today because, you know, you, for instance, have this Stargate production theme. 
that's been you know writing hits you know also for Beyonce and a lot of American artists so so but the way people produce music is also a bit different now than it used to be back then of course well that's interesting and let's bring Christian back into this because I you played aha for me I've been in Norway for about a week or so and we listened to some aha and I wonder if Casey and some of his countdowns uh, would have what he would have said about AHA? Well, AHA might uh, be a part of his, one of his countdowns. So, uh, and uh, well, I, I'm quite sure Casey would have a story to tell about uh, the origins of the group, like um, starting out in Norway, moving to London to make their success. And, uh, and that's some of the fantastic with both radio and Casey Kasem's show that he was actually always adding some interesting personal touch and information to the music. And did you feel a personal connection to him when you listened to the American Top 40? I, I fe felt it was very interesting to listening to him. Uh, at the beginning, I thought he was uh, working in the uh, American Forces Radio because uh, all the American Top 40 was new to me. But uh, yeah, well, it, he, I think he appeared at Saturday and I was listening to him again and again and was looking forward to his sessions. And did you ever make sure that you were home just so you could hear it? Yes, well, I was very uh, uh, very happy for music, very thank you for the music, as uh, Abba says. And uh, uh, at that point, uh, we didn't have um, like the digital music format. We, uh, we bought uh, uh, LP records and we taped them into cassettes, which is something that young people today, they don't even know about cassettes. But we did, so I was, uh, as many others at that time, I was laying in my bed or sitting in my chair and I was listening to the talk and when the music came on I started to record it but I was like you, you, you put, pu push the pause button and when the music is coming you just slip it and it starts so you had to be present uh, in the moment and so you had to listen to Casey Kasem in the very moment for his radio shows. Well, that's interesting. And speaking of the moment, the moment where we are now, Hans, you have written a book. I'm going to hold this up. Hans wrote a book about rock criticism, um, uh, which I think would be really interesting if you could share a little bit about why you wrote this book and what it's about and what viewers could take from this book. Uh, well, I, I wrote this book some years ago together with some you know, Nordic colleagues. Uh, and we wrote about, you know, the history of rock criticism, uh, both in the U.S. Uh, 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 and in Britain and in Nordic countries. Uh, but but uh, the basic idea is that, you know, even in so-called popular music, we think that from the 60s on, uh, popular music is, I mean, up to that point it was taken as entertainment. But from that point on, you know, a lot of writers starts to consider that as serious music and then of course you know you very well known you know the the, the, the founding of, of Rolling Stone in 1967 and those magazines you know that that, that consider the musicians almost as important as presidents you, you can see at the front pages of Rolling Stone and that that's you know illustrated very clearly so, in, in, in my view, you know, the writing about music or, or, you know, the language about music elevated rock music into art. You know, this was done by the writers. Uh, before that, you know, nobody thought about that. Or So, one interesting question, of course, is, you know, is it the best music that is selling the most? Uh, it's a difficult question because, of course, you know, the so much uh, about popular music is about success, it's a business. At the same time, you know, a lot of those hits are important as, you know, people, you know, like you and others listening to music. 
So, so it's, it's a difficult question, you know, but, but, but to, to sum it up, I, I think that, you know, the language about music, you know, made it something different. You know, you couldn't imagine that Bob Dylan would have received the Nobel Prize of Literature without people writing about it. I, I read that it's something like 3,000 books written about Bob Dylan. You know, it's more than any of us can read within our whole lifetime, right? That's a really interesting point. So when you're, and I wanted to play off one of the points that Christian just made a second ago. When you're talking to some of your students who are here at the University of Oslo or nearby where we are, many of them were born long after Casey Kasem was no longer on the radio. Um, and may, many of them may even consider Bob Dylan to be of a different generation. How are you communicating with those students in terms of studying uh, music and popular music in particular? Uh, yeah, but, but you know, uh, today everybody has access to all this music. So in, in, a, in a way I think of this also as classical music. But w w what I um, urge my students to do is to listen. You know, what's going on in this music? What do we hear? Uh, uh, and, you know, the act of listening is a way of, of you know, uh, you know, it's not just about understanding, but you know, it's it's about, about maybe also having a, a better experience. You know, music also includes some kind of knowledge. So, so uh, yeah, no, <laughs> uh, probably you know what what we hear. I mean, in, uh, here in Norway, we are also quite famous for for jazz. You know, a lot of very significant jazz performers, and you know, Keith Jarrett famously recorded with. Jan, Jan Garbarek, the quartet, recorded here in, in, in Oslo, and, and also, you know, black metal, I'm thinking of that now since we're here on the churchyard. Uh, but uh, today, you know, students listen to all of this music and it's so accessible, you know, today they use the cell phone. It used to be records in, in your time, but the music is still relevant. Well, it's, it's interesting that you, that you make that connection to jazz, since we're commemorating Casey Kasem, uh, since we are in a, a cemetery, which is, I have to say for the record, this is the first time we've ever done a taping in a cemetery. Um, but I'd also like to pay tribute to my old professor at uh, Duke University, who I took a course uh, on jazz history with him many years ago. So it's interesting that you raised the, in, back in the United States, it's interesting that you uh, raised the, the connection between rock and jazz. Uh, you know, the early rock writers, you know, for instance, at Melody Maker in, in, in Britain, uh, and also at uh, the start, you know, in uh, Rolling Stone, you know, the writers, you know, they looked to jazz criticism. Uh, in uh, the sense that they saw that jazz critics started to take the music seriously to, and, and, and to, to talk about, you know, what's going on, what's the importance of this music in society, that kind of question. So uh, I think, you know, all music is related in that sense. And Christian, when you were growing up, did you, you listen to American Top 40, to Casey's show, but what other music did you listen to? Well was a kind of a musical awakening during my life. Um, when I was uh, like uh, 12 and 13, ABBA, the Swedish group ABBA, who sort of had a breakthrough with the European Song Contest with their Waterloo song, this group was very popular. But when I started at high school, I, I met people who were into uh, re what, what would you say, uh, Hans, maybe late rhythm and blues? Mm -hmm. I was introduced to uh, Luther Vandross. I, um, I did, of course, uh, at that point, made acquaintance with Michael Jackson. Uh, but I was also introduced to um, Lee Rittner, David Sanborn, Larry Carlton, and more like, uh, and later on, Stanley Clark, Marcus Miller, of course, so which, which is more in the jazz area and jazz fusion area. So that, and and I'm stuck to this. <laughs> but, but you know, it's interesting how all these things are, are connected. And for instance, when you mentioned Luther Vandross, you know, yeah. he's 
first hit, I mean, he was, uh, you know, backing uh, David Bowie. He was backing America, David Bowie. And, and then, you know, he had this big hit, uh, Never Too Much. And just three days ago, you know, I had the guitar player that played on that track in my class. Really? At the University of Oslo for our students, yeah. you know, George Joje Vadenius. Uh, who lived for many years in, in the U.S. Uh, and uh, also played with, you know, Steely Dan and Donald Fagan. and so, yeah. so you know, the world is connected in music. You know, it's it's not just a national or nationalistic kind of mm. project. I think. Uh, uh, and if I may add, it's uh, the world is con music is connected, and uh, the new digital channels are, uh, are just wonderful for us who loves music because like like in in the actually music digital music um, uh, things like Spotify and Apple music you can see who's inspired from who and and they suggest more and more music so you broaden your musical scope and you can and with YouTube which is a fantastic thing for me you you, you can suddenly see that uh, your uh, favorite musicians are inspired from each other and also appearing on stage together so you see oh there's a, like a whole whole a to totality in your musical taste <laughs> uh, yeah no I, I don't believe in the idea that everything was better you know in the old days so 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 getting back to what we talked about just you know just right now i mean mean, mean that uh, also people today take an interest, younger people take a lot of interest in, in the old music. Uh, and uh, I also think that, you know, we who are a little older should really listen to the, the new music, you know, uh, yeah. Well, that's an interesting point, and I was going to ask you both that, which is, if we're talking about older music, how do we make room for the newer music? How do new groups uh, break out and then people get to know them? Uh, you, you know, uh, Simon Fritt, uh, a British colleague that we also, you know, had a dialogue with at our department, he recently wrote uh, an article where he says that the problem with streaming uh, today is that, that a lot of kids, they only listen to the music that they already like. That's a part of the problem. But, but you know, it's possible to, you know, so much is, you know, available and I read somewhere in a report that, that there's about like 50,000 new tunes uh, added every day on Spotify. So you know, how do we select? I think that's the challenge. That's interesting. So with that kind of number, how many, how do you select, but how do you even know about them in the first place? Yeah, and how can you select something you don't know about? And, and of course, uh, I think it's, uh, for me, it's always been about listening to music that I don't like, you know, to to find out more, you know, to listen to abstract music or music from different parts of the world. To, uh, I mean, you can also challenge your listening through, through music. Well, and to a certain extent, I think Casey Kasem did that within the orbit of the top 40. But he used to challenge people to think about where the music came from and where it had been influenced. But I think your point about challenging yourself now is an interesting one. And maybe if you wouldn't say a little bit more about that. So what advice would you have for students who might be music students, whether they're in Norway or, or elsewhere? How do you force yourself to, to do that? Yeah, but I, I find that music students are really interested because, you know, they, they are trained to listen to do and, and hear what's going on in the music. So, uh, so in a way, I don't see that as a problem. You know, I, I, I mean, part of the problem about, you know, the streaming industry has been that musicians don't feel they get enough back. Uh, because, you know, most major recording stu studios are, you know, closing uh, uh, and things like that. But you know, it's it's hard to be wise, you know, to give the... I don't think there is only one answer to that question, uh, Stephen. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, Christian, do you have a thought or two about that as someone who... I know you don't teach at the university, but you like music and, and you care about Casey Kasem. How do you force yourself to listen to new force types of music? Well, um, in, uh, in a kind of a surprising way I'm introduced to... Uh, and wonderful way I'm introduced to new music. 
because, um, well, I've been uh, indoctrinating <laughs> my children with my musical tastes. Uh, I, I have several children and they've been in the back seat and they've sort of been acquaintance to the, my kind of music. And, and now they bring new music into my life that are, well, it's re recently made, it's new music, but still ha have these kind of rhythms. And that's, it's very interesting. I th it's, it's like with, with fashion, it goes in waves and, and, and things repeats itself. So, uh, and, uh, and now it seems to be a little bit time where you even can hear the sound of disco in certain <laughs> pieces of music. And also, throughout my years with music, I, I feel that um, it's been a, 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 a blessed time from the 50s with all the writers from there. And uh, there I made covers on music. So you can hear uh, music made f f 50 years ago in vari various... Um, yeah, versions with different artists and just the recent years we also hear that uh, uh, is it hip-hop hip they are or they are sampling stuff from music so yeah What's this keeps this keeps uh, 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 evolving your musical taste and experience well I think that's really interesting because I heard from some musicians that uh, making a cover of, of somebody making a cover of your song is an ultimate compliment. Oh, well, that's interesting. Well, I, we're talking about Luther Vandross again, like uh, Bert Bacharach made uh, A House is Not a Home, and he performed that, and it was later performed with uh, Diane Warwick, and then with Luther Vandross, and now later on preferred by new artists. So it's just wonderful to be able to follow that. But, but I think we have to remember that this isn't really something new because you know yeah. there's a new yeah. generation and they ha haven't heard that music. So, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, when, uh, when, when the Beatles uh, and, when the Beatles and the Stones, for instance, you know, recorded American blues music, you know, they went to chess and met Muddy Waters. Nobody in the U.S. had heard that music, you know, on mainstream radio, mm -hmm. because you know it was a segregation between black and white, and also that was the case in the music industry. Uh, so that's one point to to be made that you know that in I mean the the music in the 1940s you know was influenced by music of the 19. 20s and the 60s or so, oh, the 40s and 50s and I, I think uh, you know every generation must be allowed also to make their own music so we it's see uh, we, we, we shouldn't think that you know everything was better in the old days I believe <laughs> but that gets to the issue of classical music how, how do you rebut if, if you do rebut the comment that somebody might say by saying classical music is classic and rock music or pop music, popular music is less classic. Uh, well, I, I uh, you know, I went to Poland uh, four years ago, uh, and and I was lucky enough to meet with you know the Polish uh, composer Penderecki, Penderecki, as they say in, in Poland, uh, and he started to make you know electronic music. And you know the the famous Trenody for the victims of Hiroshima, uh, and uh, you know Radiohead, you know uh, went there and wanted to to perform with him, you know his music. I mean uh, Greenwood from the guitar player from from Radiohead, and so so I think today there's a lot of connections, you know, between. Uh, I mean classical maybe only means old, so so, so you know uh, the. The, the the music of, of the 70s that you like mm -hmm. and the 80s is maybe you not know, of the 50 years mm -hmm. considered classical mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so and also the development with technology you know uh, the the contemporary art music scene the jazz scene and the popular music scene especially here in Norway is 
it's not merging, but, but it's interconnected in, in, in a lot of mysterious ways. Well, fair enough. I think we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I'll ask both of you quickly if you have anything you wanted to add either to an American audience watching this or, or to, about Casey Kasem. Well, it's, um, it's certainly a man who um, has been uh, giving us a lot of uh, great moments, um, wonderful music. I, I believe it was uh, uh, in, in, in business for 25 years or so. And, uh, well, uh, I, w I will keep on honoring his memory, so I, uh, I, I will attend to his grave and, uh, uh, and uh, we will, uh, at his day of birth, April 27th, we will gather a few people from uh, the um, American Women's Association here in Norway and celebrate him. And that's what we're, we're going to do that. And we will even, luckily, as we have YouTube now, we will listen to him on YouTube, actually, while doing this. Fair enough. And Hans? No, I, I think he should be celebrated, uh, l like you said. And, and you know, <laughs> I'm thinking again of the fact that he is here uh, and with all the Norwegians who wanted to make it to his list. Uh, you know, what comes to m mind is, you know, a, a band from my hometown, Stage Dolls. I think they, they made it to 44 or, or 46, uh, uh, you know, on the Billboard list in 89 with a with one of the songs, and one of the songs, you know, is Love Don't Bother Me. <laughs> what can you say when, when you're on the graveyard, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful way to end this segment, so thank you both. Normally, I would thank viewers for joining us and then doing our regular Higher Education Today close. But in honor of Casey Kasem, I'm going to first say that if you'd like to send a note to me at the show, please go ahead and do so by sending a note to higher education today at topcolleges.com. And we're going to close by saying, for all of you out there, please keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today. <laughs>